Traders Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to episode one of our Traders Podcast. My name is Offenza Nudui, and throughout this podcast, I'll be joined by my co-host, my business partner, and my great friend, Mandam Sibi. Now, for the best part of 2018, for anyone who has subscribed to our YouTube channel, you'd have noticed we've been sending us some great YouTube content from our market preparations to a market review and some of the short lessons that we've been sending out just to give you a bit of insight on how we go about performing our technical analysis on the financial market. But for 2019, we thought we could try something a little bit different and this is how we came up with the Traders Podcast. Now to try and sum it up, this is where we'll be studying some of the biggest traders around the world. We'll be going through how they started their career in trading, what made them successful and just before the podcast ends, we want to give you some references for anyone who wants to study them further. Now, there are a lot of people we could have started with, but for the first podcast, we decided to start with, can I get a drum roll? The man who broke the Bank of England. For anyone who doesn't know who that is, that is George Soros, a Hungarian investor and philanthropist born in Budapest in 1913. Now, Soros' net worth has kind of been debated over the internet. While some argue that he's worth as little as 8.1 billion and some argue that he's worth 25 billion dollars. But nonetheless, Soros has actually given away over 32 billion dollars. Now even if you do the math, that's more money than actually being estimated on. Now there's a lot of interesting things about Soros that we're going to touch on later on the podcast. But the first thing is I want us to talk about Mantle is how does one come from such a humble background to becoming the greatest speculators of our generation. Now that's a question we are all asking ourselves. How did he become one of the greatest speculators of all time and actually have a lot of billions uh, in his bank account, right? Now, in order for us to do that, we have to peek in into his life and research and see what happened uh, throughout his life that made him George Soros, right? So. An interesting thing uh, that we found throughout our research is that George Soros survived the Nazi Germany occupation in his country. It was so bad that he had to immigrate to the London School of Economics in England and study philosophy there. And later on, he actually acquired a bachelor's degree. Now, after acquiring a bachelor's degree, like many other people, after going out of school, uh, we think it's going to be a clean slate is we think it's going to be easy to succeed uh like like yeah, right most, most definitely i think i think when we tend to look at people that we idolize like great people who've done great stuff mm-hmm. in the world we tend to oversimplify the way they went about things and like my partner just mentioned after soros graduated from the london school of economics he didn't actually get to work at a bank as we would most think he started working as a travel sales agent on the seaside and this is where he mentioned that this was the most horrible time of his life and this is where Soros decided to take measures to correct his own life and the first step for Soros at that time was to write to every merchant bank in London and after doing so this so you only got two replies and one of those replies is where he got from singer and freelander where he got his first job as a clerk now think about it talk about humble beginnings even at his first bank he doesn't get to work as a trader. He only started out as a tech. So after a few years, I think through hard work, Soros managed to get a promotion to become an arbitrage trader. And this is where he met his friend Robert Mayer. I don't really know what Mayer saw at Soros at that time, but I think he saw some talent and someone who was very hardworking and determined at the time. Mm. And Mayer decided or suggested to Soros that Soros should apply at his father's hedge fund, which is FM Mayer. And at that time, this is where I believe Soros moved from London to America. Um, at that time, it was 1956. So he started working at FM Mayer, right? He worked for three years and then found a much more better job which is at uh, Witham & Co. So he started working at Witham & Co. as an arbitrage trader and specialized in European stocks. So during that, that year, he had a plan. His plan was simple. He said, I'm going to work there for five years and save 500000 in order for me to go back in London and finally finish my master's degree in philosophy. Now, during those years from 1959, to 1963, what happened is that he found a revolutionary um, 
theory that he formed and developed, which was inspired by Karl Popper. This theory, he calls it a theory of reflexivity. Now, in order for us to understand the theory of reflexivity, Josaurus believes that we have to understand the principles underlying reflexivity. The first principle is the principle of fallibility. In order for, under, for us to understand the principle of fallibility, we have to know that nobody is infallible. Nobody is perfect in the world. And the market consists of two or more people where buyers and sellers meet. So he believes that participants in the market or anywhere have usually have a distorted view of the world. And these distorted are often partial. The following principle is the principle of reflexivity. Now he believes that knowing the principle of fallibility, knowing that people have distorted views and partial views of the world. Now these views can influence the situations to which they relate because false views usually lead to inappropriate actions. Let me give you an example. Usually when we treat drug addicts as criminals, it usually tends to lead to criminal activities or criminal behavior. How so? Well, there's this interesting a quote and i forgot the author but this person um this quote stuck with me it says i am not what i think i am i am not what you think i am i am what i think you think i am which means that we live in a perception of a perception of ourselves and this means that we act consistently to how we see the world and how we see ourselves also so this drug addict, the external stimuli, which is the world, how people treat him, and internal stimuli, which is how he views himself, it tends to gradually progress throughout his life. People treat him bad and treat him as a criminal, and thus it leads to criminal activity and behavior. Um, let me give you another example. Yeah. Say that you have a child and this child continues to fail throughout his uh, school life. And if you treat this child as a failure, unconsciously so, this child will then continually and gradually see himself as a failure and thus eventually act accordingly to how he sees himself. Yeah, like... What Soros is basically trying to explain is that if enough people believe in something long enough, that has the ability to become reality. Just to give you an example, what happened in my country before we got Cyril Ramaphosa as president? Before he became president, people were vouching for him, believing that since he's a great business mogul, this will have a positive impact on our country. And to my surprise, the day Cyril got elected as president, the rent strengthened. Now at that point he had actually done nothing to the event but just him being elected as president that perception of people eventually became reality. So to further understand this concept of reflexivity, Soros thinks there has to be two thinking participants and these two thinking participants serve two purposes. Number one being to understand the world in which we live in. He calls this the cognitive function. Number two, to be able to change the situation to advantage. He calls this the manipulative or participating function. Now these two functions when they operate at the same time can sometimes interfere with each other. But that is not always the case. And in some instances, example, when you're driving, these two participating functions can confluence with each other. Now just to give you a brief example when driving, you need to be able to understand the world in which you're driving, which is now your connective function is operating. But at the same time, you need to be able to influence that situation to advantage which is the manipulative function will also be effective at that point of time now moving along there's also what he calls reflective statements they can either be subjective or objective to give you an example if i'd say to you this is the best youtube channel that is subjective because there's to be a lot of thinking a lot of investigating going on before we can conclude but if i was to say to you today is a shiny day and if you go outside Indeed, it is a shiny day. That's an objective statement. Now, these statements can take the form of a feedback loop. To give you an example, just keep in mind the keyword will be influence. Now, participants influence the cost of event. The cost of event influence 
people's perceptions. As you can see, the word influence is circular and continuing. Now, if you could go back to the example of Siro Ramaphosa. People's perception of Siro Ramaphosa influenced the cost of event. Cost of event being the rent strengthening. But also the rent strengthening influenced people's views. Meaning once the rent strengthened, investors could start putting in money thinking, oh, the rent is starting to be strong. So this, this could be a good thing for us to invest in. So to try and sum it up, Thinking constitutes the subjective of reality and events constitute the objective of reality. Just to quote Soros before I ended up, when reality has no subjective aspects, there can no longer be reflexivity. I totally agree with you on that. And just to add a couple of points on that, when Cyril was elected, the market was so elated that it caused the rent to go up. Whether will it go up and stay up we don't know. All we know is that we are in a state of a loop. Either A, a negative feedback loop, or B, a positive feedback loop. Now, a negative feedback loop is self-correcting, which brings the participants' views closer together and may lead to equilibrium. And in order for a negative feedback loop to happen, Cyril has to make decisions and the government to make decisions that are self-correcting with the expectations of the market, which means they have to make decisions that are good for the economy and stimulate economic growth in the market, and they would correct and be in equilibrium with the expectations of the market. Or B, the market will be in a state of a positive feedback loop. Now, a positive feedback loop is self-reinforcing. Now, this feedback loop can't go on forever because these views will go so far from equilibrium and thus cause a climax. If this happens, ne, that would mean that the government or Cyril Ramaphosa doesn't meet up with these expectations and thus the decisions made don't stimulate growth in the economy. Eventually, the investors and speculators into the market would realize that and then the rent would go down as they pull out their positions. Now, we've been trying to explain the theory of reflexivity in simple terms in order for everybody to catch on and understand. Now, if you feel like this was elementary, we left the links below in the description box in order for you to do your further research on it. Now, moving on to the last part of our podcast, we'll be touching on Black Wednesday. The day that George Soros made that historical treat that made him the George Soros that we know of today. But for us to understand exactly how we went about the $1.5 billion trade, we need to go back to the era of the ERM. The European Exchange Rate Mechanism was set up in 1979 to keep the various European currencies relatively stable against one another. Now this was also set on an assumption that if all 11 countries were under one system, this would eliminate or reduce the chances of them getting in war with one another. Now I think the second explanation of the ERM kind of makes sense to me because as I think about it, if I was the president of Germany, I wouldn't want to go to war with Spain. Because if they would hurt the economy of Spain, they would later on hurt the economy of Germany. Now I think that was the only thing that makes sense of the ERM <laughs> to, to my understanding of the policy itself. But the system could only work if various countries coordinated the economic policies. Now we need, we need to understand exactly how the ERM functioned. When differences in interest rates and inflation rates among the 11 got out of hand, the bank had to intervene to buy thus support the weakening currencies against speculators and currency hedges. In former times, central banks could usually frustrate speculators by simply buying massive amounts of the weaker currency and flooding the market with the stronger one. Now, the easiest example I could give you on this is with the German mark and the Britain pound. Now, in the case that the pound was weakening, the most logical step for the ERM to do at that time was to buy the pound against the German mark. Now, in this case, if I was a speculator at that time and the, pound wa and the pound was weakening, the most logical thing after performing my technical analysis would be to sell the pound. And in the opposite, if the German mark was in the bullish market, I would want to buy the German mark. 
But in that case, if the central bank was to intervene by buying the pound and selling the German mark, that would mean there would be bad news for both my positions as I would get stopped out on both of my positions. Now this is what they meant by central banks had the ability to frustrate speculators at the time. But this only sounded like a good system only on paper. When Britain joined the ERM, its country was already in a recession. Now for anyone who understands economics, when a country is in a recession, the most logical step for a government to intervene would be to increase spending in the country. Now they would do so by decreasing interest rate. Hopefully they would, they would encourage small business owners to take more loans, make more employment and encourage citizens to take more loans, buy more houses, buy more cars, just to increase spending in the country in order to stabilize the economy. Now for Britain, they couldn't decrease their interest rate because if they were to do so, they would have to get kicked out, out of the ERM and governor of Britain at the time kind of was against decreasing interest rates. Soros and the others had a simple technique, go short the weakest currency. As Britain and Italy struggled to make their currencies attractive, they were forced to maintain high interest rates to attract foreign investment. Now like I explained, this was the most irrational and illogic step for Britain to take at that time and this was the start for bad news for Britain and, and Italy. On the other hand, Germany had embarked on a policy of trying to restrain its own economy. Now for Germany at that time, Germany was kind of doing well, but it couldn't um, do better because it was kind of being held back by the weaker currencies of the other countries. Now at that time, they wanted to go out of the ERM or the force their policy to take out the weaker countries out of the ERM. When large institutions, mutual funds and multinational corporations that had to do massive hedging to protect their profits started selling the weaker European currencies in September, the traders immediately picked up and jumped in in volumes. Now, knowing Joseph was uh, with his edge over the market, he saw this way before many people actually saw this. So what he did is that and in the beginning of August 1992, he and his fund built a position against the pound. And at the end of August 1992, um, his position was worth 1.5 billion against the pound. However, the market didn't move as such and there had to be other confirmation of the market moving drastically against the pound. So by September 15, the Bundesbank president said he doesn't rule out that other currencies might be under pressure. That was a rather hawkish statement. However, it was really enough for George Soros to hop in and add to his position of 1.5 billion pounds so what he did is that later on that night he added his position and borrowed from many invest investment banks and into institutional banks and he raised his position to be 10 billion pounds against the pound that was enough to move the market and by september 17 8 40 a.m chancellor norman limont authorized a purchase of 1 billion to actually frustrate the market and stop out many speculators into the market. It was rather less effective as they, as they thought it would be and they tried again to purchase another two billion pounds to do the same. However, it wasn't effective. The last resolution was for John Major to raise the interest rates. So however, Britain was in a recession at that time. So it couldn't raise interest rates because it would hurt the economy, just like my partner said. However, uh, Chancellor Norman Limont urged John Major, Minister of Britain at that time, to raise interest rates. And finally, they raised interest rates by 2% during that day. And then they raised by another 3%, which went from 10% interest rates to 15% interest rates. Now, they did this because they wanted to attract foreign investments and to actually cause the market to, to go bullish for the pound. And that wasn't effective. And they purchased to 27 billion pounds in total. However, speculators and investors out there saw that the pound had to be devalued and Britain had to devalue their currency. So they went short 
short, 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 short. Finally, by 7.30 p.m., the British bank uh, accepted defeat and the Chancellor gave a speech saying that Britain had to be suspended from the ERM. And that was rather um, a good news from George Soros, who profited one billion pounds in profit net from this shortcoming of the pound. And days later, the pound failed by 15% against the German mark, 25% against the US dollar. In the aftermath, most speculators, known and unknown, benefited from this trade too. To name a few, Paul Tudor Jones uh, benefited $250 million from this shortcoming of the pound. And Bruce Kovner benefited $300 million from this. This goes to show that with good analysis and a good team around you, and most importantly, an edge over the market, it was enough for Soros and it is enough for many of investors out there to succeed into this market, into this industry. It was enough for Joe Soros to bring the Bank of England to its knees. Well, guys, unfortunately, that's about all we have for this podcast. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Traders Podcast. If you are new to this channel and you like what you see, hit that like button below and subscribe for more of this content. For me, Mandla, here at FX Link and Offense, we will see you on the next episode of the Traders Podcast.